Assalamu alaikum. Welcome to Hijra Holistics. Today, let's discuss the retreat to the Rainy Mountains. So, in Hadith, we have uh, a warning from our Nebi, peace be upon him, where he, he tells us that when when we move into this, this time of, of turbulence and turmoil and tribulation, to head to the, the rainy mountains with, with sheep and goats to retreat there. Um, which is very interesting because this, this actually echoes um, Isa alayhi salam, Nebi Yeshua, peace be upon him, where he says that, uh, he says that when, when we get into these end times, you know, to flee to the mountains, you know, that we can't know the exact time, but we can know the season. We can, we can get the, the sense of when it's, when it's coming. Now, people have been thinking that we're in, you know, in the end times for 2,000 years. And I would argue that, that, they were, that everybody was actually correct because you have a limited number of years and it's always, it's always the end of the world. Especially, I mean, if you see the Mongols coming over the ridge, it's the end of the world. If you see... Um, you know, if you if you have to walk through land, uh, a field of landmines, it's the end of the world. If you uh, are, are are doused in in chemical weapons, it's the end of the world. If you're eating genetically modified foodstuffs, it's the end of the world. Um, if you're going through a divorce, it's the end of the world. Um, all these, you know, it's like you get fired from your job, you got babies to feed, it's the end of the world. My whole point is that. There are all these difficulties that we've been facing each generation for so long, and we are each destined to die and face judgment, right? And so in this sense, whether you live 20 years or you live 80 years, whether there is a lull, I mean, all wars have, have lulls and, and truces and, and uh, periods of peace. A war could go on for decades, a war can go on um, for a for hundred years plus. This has happened many times. And then it all depends how we're defining war, how we're defining the end of the world. People keep on thinking that everything has to be within, say, a seven-year time frame or a very, it has to be within this certain sequence. But if we stretch that sequence out um, and unpack it and read it from v different angles, then other readings uh, become apparent. And um, so... I, I just look at it like go to the mountains is related to get back into nature, get out of the cities, get out of urban environments. And now more than ever, we see, and, and historically, cities have always had their benefits, but they've always had their dangers as well. And, you know, we've seen the cycles that happen with cities, and it's always been, you know, better for people's health to live on the land, near the land. Um, to engage in um, shepherding and farming, uh, to engage in uh, hunting and gathering. Even with farming, we'll often supplement our diets with gathering, gathering, um, you know, mushrooms, uh, gathering, uh, you know, healing roots and, and herbs and spices and flowers, um, various, you know, berries, um, leaves, wild plants that often get defined as weeds, but really a lot of what are called weeds are some of the greatest healers and nutrifiers that we can find, you know, just the dandelion plant right there. You know, its, it's leaves are uh, nutrient dense greens that we can eat as raw in raw salads. We can cook into different, uh, different dishes, uh, you know, um, various green dishes. Um, cooking them similar to the way we might cook uh, spinach or, or kale or collards or something like that. Well, you don't have to cook it as long. Um, the roots have have many benefits and are edible and have healing properties. They they you know if uh, they can cleanse the the liver, um, you know the um, the stem, the little white substance that's in the stem of the dandelion can uh, help to get rid of warts and has other medical benefits. The flowers have various benefits and are also edible. Um, so anyway, the entire plant it's called a weed, but it's beneficial. Um, so go to the mountains. When, when our Nebi is saying go to the mountains and, and th he is echoing another Nebi who's returning, both in relationship to this time, we've got the literal expression of go to the mountains and go to the rainy mountains where, where you will have 
um, water sources, you know, rain coming from the sky. Now, of course, with rain coming from the sky, when we're talking about devil tech, um, it becomes more complex. Is there a way, how do we filter this water and make benefit, you know, take, you know, take benefit from it. But then, you know, if it goes into the earth in the mountains and then uh, collects in reservoirs and goes through, uh, through a wetland area, perhaps it begin, becomes filtered and then we can go through a filtration process with it. We can do water caches, water collecting. Maybe we can find uh, wells, deep water wells, find springs. Um, this is different, definitely difficult um, for a number of reasons because of private property and, and um, how, how land has been secured off and, and you know, areas are, you know, you can't just wander wildly. Um, and then people also, there's so many people in the world that, that people are aware where there are springs, where there are caves, et cetera, et cetera. Um, there are some places that have a tremendous amount of karst. Karst regions are very interesting, like um, Turkey and Southeast Europe, I mean, yeah, Southeast Europe, like around, you know, Croatia, Serbia, Bosnia, Herzegovina, Kosovo, Macedonia, you know, Greece, um, I guess parts of Bulgaria and Romania as well are karst regions. That's even where we get the word karst. It means that limestone regions where you get lots of caves, lots of sinkholes, um, you know, uh, st underground streams, underground rivers, um, poolings of water, um, cold water springs, uh, although hot water springs are often in these locations, like throughout Turkey, you'll find hot springs as well as cold springs. And Turkey is just basically, you see the karst begins in the western section of lower Anatolia, straight across all the way out by the Iran border and then beyond, I believe. And then there's also karst up near uh, in, the, in the Black Sea region in the uh, Pontic Mountains. Um, I believe uh, that's karst uh, considerably. I mean, this is, this is Al-Kaf country in Turkey for sure. Um, from my perspective, Aluhu Alam, but it's, it's straight up karst country. And then you go to, you know, um, in the United States, there's a, a huge section of karst, um, throughout like say Missouri, Arkansas, the, the, um, Southern Illinois, part of Indiana, uh, Kentucky, Tennessee, part of Alabama, where just a ridiculous number of caves and uh, hills and springs and underground streams, um, sinkholes. I mean, uh, where I grew up with, there were tons of sinkholes all around. Um, anyway, it's, 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 it's quite interesting and lots of caves. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and, and, and stop with the, with the literal aspect of it. And then I just wanted to share a practical, uh, spiritual practice aspect to go to the Rainy Mountains. So going to the rain, because right now the rug is getting pulled from like, so I've been engaging in, in, um, eschatological analysis, um, of, uh, you know, like, like I've been analyzing, um, end times traditions from around the world for quite some time. And it's interesting because um, at different points, what I've noticed in, 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 in the spiritual search is oftentimes Allah will guide it because Allah is the guide. And everything within his creation is, uh, he teaches us through. If we have, if we're seeking him, then we are finding teachings and lessons in every single thing around it. That's why we, we are to read the outer signs and the inner signs. Everything has a messenger from Allah for us. You know, like, uh, you know, if we're, if we're seeking, you know, and we, if, if we are, if the prophetic reality is, is, uh, expressing itself within us, then we are, we're better able to read everything around us and within us. We're seeking truth and we are being transformed and aligning our true our, our way our, our entire life in accordance with truth with truth honesty justice mercy compassion forgiveness you know learning how to let things go to be non warmly non-attached um so in going to the rainy mountains um so i i i was telling you about the studying of eschatology to say that um all of a sudden we're confronting certain prophecies that it's like either something is wrong with the tradition perhaps or the analysis or we, we have to read it from a different angle. And the way I look at it is we need to read things from holistically from as many angles as possible to be as a, to get as close to the actual accurate truth as possible. You know, 
because a, a literal reading, while literal readings always have have a benefit as a starting point, um, little children read literally. They think literally. Literalism, and, and while they also have like their, their uh, you know, an imaginal way, uh, an expansive way of, of reading the world, which is quite beautiful, subhanAllah, but when they're learning how to read text, you don't want to present, they don't really under, little children, if you study, you know, child development, little children typically don't understand allegory, metaphor, symbolism, until they get to be maybe 12, 13, even 14 years old. So developmentally, we have to, you know, like we have to include, and, and all of that is part of it. We want our children to be able to read things literally. We want our children to read things and, and think imaginatively. You know, we want our children to be able to read symbolically, allegorically, metaphorically when they reach that age. Um, but it's like, at, like, my whole point is that we have to engage in a holistic reading and a realistic reading. But if we are overly literal with everything, it's an impoverished way of reading and approaching not only text, but the world. You know, it's, it's poverty. It's not a rich toolkit. We need, we need a serious toolkit to study, to study uh, prophecy. We've got to be able to, to, to think in a very, very wide-ranging, open-hearted, sharp-minded manner. And along these lines, um, I found that, so, so right now, with the world, so much has shut down. I used to think, first, I didn't know that I was going to make Hijra. I had no clue. Allah pushed me into Hijra. And I had no idea where he was sending me. And so many doors were shut. Some were slammed. Windows were boarded up. And, um, and then I thought, you know, like when I first became aware of like, oh, wow, I'm actually making Hijra. I, I didn't, I'm, you know, I've made Hijra. What am I doing? You know, it's like I thought, I thought that I was going to be maybe going into uh, some kind of a, of a village situation in nature. And then all of those things fell through and fell apart. And then like, you know, more and more countries were shut down. Things have opened up a bit recent, recently, but then we're also seeing that, that countries are becoming more, more strict about residencies and making it more complex. And there's a lot of uncertainty, um, all kinds of problems. So then this leads to, okay, so what is being meant by go to the mountains? And then you find out that many places don't have mountains available. So here's another way of looking at it. What's another way? When, when we study comparative contem contemplative traditions, you know, the, the contemplation traditions around the world, um, when we study the martial arts traditions, when we study the religious traditions comparatively, all of these things, and we study the healing traditions of the world comparatively, we see that, that there are a number of, in postural medicine, um, you know, the... the, the the concept that various postures and poses hold medical benefit. Like if you walk around with bad posture, you're always leaning over, you're always leaning back, you're, you know, you don't sit properly. You know, like uh, I've, got a, I've got a friend who, um, who was in architecture school and they, um, for, for a number of years, they were sitting on these benches that they, they, so they didn't have proper spinal alignment and they were leaning in at weird angles over the, the, the drawing table. And they wound up with, with some serious back issues. And if you've ever had a back, uh, back issue, like a pulled muscle, you find out that just a, a little pulled muscle from throwing your, a heavy backpack on the wrong, at the wrong angle, that it impacts everything. It, it impacts your ability to do basic things. You automatically feel like you're, you're, you know, 79 years old and, and, you know, uh, or you feel like you just ran a marathon. Um, you can't think properly, you know, like, like your mood is not right. You're not in a balanced state. You're out of balance. This is related to postural medicine. So posture is very important, correct posture. So when you are um, sitting to contemplate breath or body sensation or sound, um, it is highly recommended to sit up straight with your spine aligned like a stack of gold coins, which suggests that your spinal cord is very valuable and posture is very 
very beneficial and um, that it's actually a wealth that we have. To have health is wealth and we should appreciate it. And that we should sit with dignity, with integrity, with self-respect. We should honor this beautiful, excellent body and immune system that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has granted us with. Alhamdulillah. This is a beautiful path. So anyway, so postural medicine, you know, it, it talks about proper alignment. And what's interesting is that there are poses that are in, like the, when we stand in salah, the, the way that you are standing, when you're standing subtle and you're just standing there with your arms at your side before the prayer's begun or during pauses, various pauses, and you're standing, you know, straight with integrity, with dignity, your feet, your feet are facing, they're, they're facing forward at shoulder width apart, directed toward the Qibla, and you have proper spinal alignment, and you're standing with dignity, with integrity, with respect. It's a beautiful posturing. And then when you have your hand clasping the same way, um, when you are bowing, you know, like you still have a certain, you have, you know, your, you have a spinal alignment that is angular. When you go down and you make sajda, you have spinal alignment that's angular. And then when you are sitting, you are sitting with your spine erect, again, with integrity, with dignity, with beauty, with excellence, with self-respect. You are honoring the, the lineage of Adam alayhi salam. You are honoring your humanity. You are honoring your creator who has made you beautiful and excellent with, a, with an excellent immune system and an excellent framework and an excellent mind. So every single posture with, so notice if the standing position, the beginning position is called mountain pose, like say in Hatha yoga, in that aspect of postural medicine, they call the, that, that posture mountain pose. So standing in, in prayer is a mountain pose. So is the bowing. The bowing, you resemble a flat top mountain, all right? When you are sitting, you resemble a mountain. You know, when you are, when you're, uh, you know, when you are reciting the, the shahada, when you are offering your salams, you know, like, uh, and, and you know, it's like your, your head turning to the right and the left. You're, you're shaped like a mountain from various angles. Also, when you are in sajda, you are an angled mountain, you know? So these are all mountain poses. Additionally, when you sit in contemplation, cross-legged, Say you've got, you know, like in a cross-legged pose, like crisscross applesauce, although that's not the most energy efficient, stable pose. That's a good little kid pose. But as you progress with, with stable sitting to observe breath, body sensation, sound, or you are sitting and reading in this position, or you're sitting to get a good stretch, or you're, you know, you're observing something in nature, you're a sunset, and you're sitting cross-legged, you've got your legs in front of you with your spine aligned straight. We call that Burmese pose, but really it's Mon position. That's a different discussion, but we wanna honor people accurately in, with titles. Um, you know, oftentimes we call any cross-legged position Indian position because in India there have been so many people, and in South Asia there have been so many people who have sat and contemplated in various ways cross-leggedly. But cross-legged, it's a universal posturing that you will find in depictions of people worldwide, the Mayans, the Aztecs, you know, the Europeans. I mean, oftentimes this is a common, pose, although I, I think less so for the Europeans. Um, but Anyway, so you've got Burmese posture, you've got half lotus where, where one leg is stacked over the other and half lotus, and then full lotus where the legs are, you know, the feet are above. These are all stable contemplation positions. They are mountain poses. You actually look like a mountain when you are sitting in this position. It's a mountain pose. So stable sitting, sajda, all of these are, are positions where you can stand or sit or bow in silence, in stillness, in darkness, it is stable. You can be positioned and you can contemplate sound. You can contemplate Quranic recitation. You can, where you are listening to the Imam, where you are listening to your own recitation, or, or uh, you can contemplate body sensation. You can contemplate breath. You can con contemplate um, the expansion and contraction of your chest or your belly, your diaphragm. Um, you can observe the breath in the nostrils, in the mouth. 
you can observe the the pulse points the blood flow through the wrist through the angle uh, through the ankles you can, uh, through the temples through the jugular veins you can observe the body sensation in the palms of your hands in the soles of your feet all throughout the body you can um, contemplate you know um, you can think through things um, so for instance when you go into sajda you pray to Allah you know, you like so. For instance, when you're standing and you're bowing, you are you are praising Allah. You are you are offering glorification. When you are sitting, you are you are repenting, and you are witnessing. It's a witnessing pose. And when you're contemplating anything, you're witnessing, you're observing, um, you're listening, you're 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 speaking, you're listening, you are you're you're engaging all of your senses. And you know you're you're feeling things. You're feeling your your body contact, bodily contact with the surface of the earth, with your clothing, with the wind. You're observing stillness and movement. You're observing uh, motion and pause. All these various things are con contemplative aspects. When you are in sajda, you are. This is a place of dua where you are able to pour your heart out and, and request things of Allah. And I would suggest always, always. Ask, don't ask what you want. Don't ask for what you want or what you think you, you need. Not what you hope for. Pray for what you actually need because your Lord knows exactly what you need. Pray for what you need and ask that you would, you would see clearly, that you would recognize, that you would see the signs and that you would recognize how to behave appropriately, that you would know how to make toba properly, that you would know how to make tazkiyah properly, that you would know what tawakul really means and how to go into an egoless flow state so that you can get the signals clear and survive and thrive during these dangerous, difficult days. Um, pray for enlightenment, that you would see things clearly as they really are. Pray for an expansive heart. Pray for a sharp, expansive mind for a critical thinking apparatus that can read through uh, delusion and deception and see things accurately the way they really are. Pray for a pure and purifying tongue, a pure and purifying mind and body and expression. Pray to, 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 to live this path of sadaka beautifully and excellently. So the thing is, when you go into still, silent sajda, pour your heart out, but then sit in sajda, stay sajda, and, and, and seek, to, seek to hear the messages that Allah gives you. Because oftentimes in sajda, Allah will bring forth memories. Those memories are for you to, those are signs for you to contemplate, to consider what you did right and, and, and what was beautiful about the experience and give thanks and appreciate it, what you could do better, what you need to make amends for, who you need to make things right with, what you need, you know, what you could have done differently that now you can repent and do better in the future um, with yourself and others. Um, maybe thoughts about people so you can pray with those thoughts about those people, pray for loved ones and pray for, you, you use those people as archetypes. Perhaps a person comes to mind and you're supposed to make dua for them, but also to make dua for people that are like them. Or you are thinking about something about yourself something comes to mind and now you can pray for not just yourself and your struggle. I'm struggling with X, Y, and Z. I'm going to pray for everyone in the Uma who is also struggling with X, Y, and Z. I'm going to pray for anyone in the world who is struggling with X, Y, and Z. Because remember, the whole world is the Uma of Adam alayhi salam and everyone is born on fitra. Everybody is really a Muslim but is not yet remembered. So may we all remember. This does not mean that everybody is a, uh, is a Muslim in a Mohammedan sense, but anyone who is in surrender to truth and who dissolves the egoistic, unhealthy attachments to wrong-headed notions and wrong-hearted no notions about people, places, things, and ideas and systems, and begins a process of purification and letting go, of dissolving their bonds and their hold upon them and their heart and their mind and their tongue and their, their limbs, you know. So this process, so mountain pose, is highly beneficial and is the pose to engage in, you know, these postures, standing, bowing, sitting, prostrating, stable, cross-legged sitting positions 
Also, you could sit with a bench underneath you or pillows directly underneath you like you're riding on a horse. The Japanese call that seiza. It means horse, sti si uh, horse style or saddle style. Um, so you find, you know, or you could sit with your back straight in a chair. This is also a stable position. It's also a mountain posture. You are sitting like you are a mountain. Your body is a mountain. Your body is also, um, your body is also a mobile tree. You are a tree. You are a garden. You are a garden under which rivers flow. You are made of the earth and you are the earth. You are a microcosm and a macrocosm. SubhanAllah, this is, this is, this path is paradoxical, but paradox is not a problem. Paradox is a path. Paradox is opportunity for purification and perfection. Perfection is maturation. This is a beautiful path. So spend a lot of time in various mountain positions to get the signal clear. Pour out your heart. Ask for what you need. Ask Allah to teach you what hijra really is. And I would argue that hijra means to leave behind all the, all the Dajjalic inputs and outputs and to leave all unnatural, synthetic, modified, artificial, inauthentic, delusional um, thoughts, words, actions, actions, substances, inputs, ways of living and doing things, leaving those things behind and replacing them with that which is better, which is organic, pure, garden-like, ethical, real, um, authentic, uh, true, garden-like. So anyway, all of these things are interrelated, hijra, mountain poses, you know, and like, and what's ideal, if you can, live as a, a, the most natural lifestyle possible wherever you are, and then keep on praying for insight and guidance, and there, you know, while you might make hijra in your own house, in your own body, in your own vicinity initially by preparing and being ready, and then maybe you move to, to an area outside of the area that you live, you know, further out, um, or maybe within your own country, within your own region. And then it may lead to another relocation someplace else. But right now, relocation to many countries may not actually be ideal. If you don't speak the language, you don't know the culture, um, it doesn't matter. Even if you see, oh, those people are Muslims, really? What does that really mean? Show me where the, where the Ummah is unified. People, people will rip each other, each other to threads over belief. I mean, this is crazy to me. It's literally an insane path it, for those people behaving in this way. They're ripping, they're, they're ripping the, the, the skin off of their brothers and sisters. They're annihilating people's reputations. To, to character assassination and destruction is, is quite literally a form of murder. It is corruption in the earth. You're corrupting your own earth and clay. I'll discuss that more in another video, but let us spend a lot of time in mountain poses, late night in the mountains under a starlit sky, you know, late night prayers, early morning prayers. I mean, prayer anytime you can. Spend a lot of time in sejda and spend a lot of time in stable sitting positions. And remember, spinal alignment, because you have spinal alignment when you're standing, when you're bowing, when you are sitting, and when you are prostrating. You, your head, your neck, your spine, from the tip of your backbone to the tip of your head are all properly aligned, which includes a whole sequence of hormonal glands, hormonal centers, and nerve clusters. All along those vertebrae, all within the skull, from the genital region, up through the, um, the diaphragmic region, up through the chest cavity and the heart region, up through the, uh, the neck, the throat, the vocal cord area, so basically all this is, is a certain area, and then from, from here up, you know, I mean, like, these all kind of borderlands always blur together, but spend a lot of time in the mountains. You are much loved and deeply appreciated. May we come out of all of our miseries, may we come out of all delusion, and may we see things clearly. May we live righteously, justly, beautifully, excellently, mercifully, compassionately. May we go into the deepest sejda and be brought into, um, may we be made upright, rectified, mature, perfect, and beautiful, and excellent. Till next time, assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu.